and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Brent Dio Smith. We have Jean Ray on camera. Uh, unfortunately, Jamie and Viem have been waylaid due to some technical difficulties, but hopefully they'll be out as soon as possible. And then we have Geraldine and Louise in final control. So it has it was a rather quiet but very beautiful morning. So we are heading out now into the last area where we saw those male leopard tracks just at the off chance that he has crossed out of the block that we think he went into during the day. But other than that, our plan for this evening's sunset safari is not to have a plan. We're just gonna meander through the bush, see what fascinates us, and we'll stop accordingly. So don't forget, if you are fascinated by something, drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Dive on Twitter. So, Zizi, a new viewer, welcome Zizi to this live African safari. Uh, Zizi would like to know if our camera moves automatically or if there's someone behind it. Zizi, there's a very big, smelly person behind it. His name is Jean-Dre. There you go, there's his hand, and here's our cameraman today. So there is a person behind it. It would be quite nice if it could move automatically and we wouldn't have to deal with any cameraman, but alas, no, I'm only joking, Jean-Dre, shame. No, we've got very, very great cameramen, and they help us with spotting and also looking, at, looking for tracks. So a really, really integral part of our team. So we do need them. What was that noise? I think it was a birdie. I can't see where it was. But yes, no. The cameramen are operated, and the cameras are operated by a cameraman. And of course, uh, being automatic, it would be very difficult to get to the right spot in and on the action. So that's why we need experienced wildlife cameramen like we have. Very clear day, the sun is shining. It's around 30 degrees Celsius, which is 78 Fahrenheit, I think, somewhere around there. So I apologize, it's 84 Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna we're gonna zoom in quickly there, and there we go. I just wanted to, in case they flew off before we got closer, looks like a pair of brown snake eagles. And that it is. Let's try again a little bit closer. So all the snake eagle species. I've got some really cool little adaptations that helps them catch the serpents of Africa. Of course, they don't feed exclusively of serpents. They will eat little rodents and lizards and other reptiles and other mammals as well. But they have no feathers on their legs and they have a very thick scaling on their legs that helps protect them from the bites of snakes and enables them to catch and kill snakes. Now, we have quite a few species here. Uh, the most common of the proper true snake eagles that we see is the, these guys. I'm trying to find a gap through the branches. I think it's going to be a little bit better, but further down the road, uh, which is the brown snake eagle. Uh, the batelier, which we see quite often as well, is a relative of the brown snake eagles, although it, it is more of a scavenger than a true snake eater, although they will also hunt snakes if given the opportunity. Now, there are, as I said, a few others. The black-breasted snake eagle is not one we see too often here, and it is one I'm missing from my Juma list. So who knows, maybe snake eagle luck is on our side today, and we'll be able to produce 
a snake eagle or three we haven't seen before. Now, it has been a glorious summer's day. The sun is shining, and uh, there are lots of little flowers out below us. Most of them are justitias, but on these justitias are a huge amount of butterflies, and we've got quite a few different species at the moment. Here we go, look at that. Now, let's have a look. Okay, so we've got some of the whites, and we've got a yellow, but it's not, oh, does it have a sulfur tip, an orange tip to the edge, that yellow? Unfortunately, I, yes, it does. I can't remember that one's name, and I did forget my butterfly book there. But there we go, those are whites and yellows, very, very descriptively named. But we do have a few other species that have slightly better names than white and yellow. Let's just have a quick look. I did see a few. There are some vagrants. Oh, OK. If we come out of it, Jandre, and we go to the base of that guari tree, There we go, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and a little bit more to the right, slightly out a bit. Sorry, I'm just trying to see. A little bit more to the right. I think Jandre is messing with me, but now it's just be patient. You see, there's a little, beautiful little yellow pansy. That's the one we're looking for. Uh, there we go, some brown veined whites. We've got some. African vagrants, but that dash of color in the middle when it flies is called the yellow pansy. There it is. Look at that with those beautiful blue eyes and black and yellow on the wing. It is fascinating. It almost looks like the ground is alive with butterflies in this particular area. So, and they're all feeding off the same species of flower which is a yellow justicia. So really fascinating stuff. Uh, it's not always about the leopards and the lions. It's also to do with the butterflies and birds and other fantastic creatures we get out here. Oh, scarlet tip. Oh, he's very fast. We're gonna, he's going to drive Jandre absolutely mad. But Jandre, being the consummate professional that he is, was on him till he disappeared. But uh, Scarlet Tip is a white butterfly. It's got this incredible red tip on its wings, but they are very, very fast, so quite difficult to get. But it is absolutely beautiful. I have a very special spot for butterflies, and I actually decided this year was the year I was going to brush up on my butterfly knowledge, and we have found some species that I haven't been able to identify in the books, so I've emailed them off to an entomologist, or actually, sorry, a le lepidopterist, to try and identify those unknown butterfly species. So there are many hundreds of different butterfly species in Africa, and some of the more difficult to identify are these tiny little blue guys. And I think we've only ever managed to get one or two on camera, because they are near impossible to see uh, when we're driving. So a big welcome to Bonnie, who's a first-time viewer. Welcome to the Safari Live family, Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie says she thinks this is just wonderful for those who can't travel. Uh, absolutely amazing. Well, Bonnie, and we're glad you enjoy it, and we really do appreciate your feedback and comments, and we lo do love to share our passion for Africa and its animals with all of you guys out there. Here are some birds. Let's see if we can catch up with them. Tamara would like to know why do birds call all night at Juma? But where she lives, oh, it flew away. Don't worry. In Holland, it's completely silent. But we've got another one. Let's just try. Here we go. 
one of my favourite. You got him, Jean-Dre? Uh, up into the left. Oh, there he's jumping there. Yeah. There's a speaking of a bird tomorrow. Oh, it's got something. It's a white helmet shrike. And it. Oh, it got stolen. <laughs> Before it could swallow, it got swallowed by another one. So that is white helmet shrikes. They live in small flocks, seven to eleven birds. Very, very pretty guys. Look at that wonderful yellow eye. So there, we have seen quite a lot of birds feeding off caterpillars. Tomorrow I haven't forgotten you. I will be back to your question once we finish watching this little guy. Oh, look at it. As he comes out into the, the sunlight, you can see how striking a bird he really is. In search of another tasty morsel. Often referred to as the, ooh, mist. Seven sisters. Uh, it's often in flocks of seven. Of course, in the flock, they're not all sisters. It'll be a mixture of males and females. Oh, off it goes. Isn't that wonderful? So, tomorrow I will get to you now, but uh, just that we saw that helmet strike feeding off that, uh, looked like an inchworm of some kind. And uh, Dee would like to know, with the, the late rains we had, has the insect life improved? It has immensely, Dee. There's an absolute huge number of insects. Probably not as much as there were earlier in the season, but uh, driving around at night with the spotlight, you do take a little risk as the beetles bang into your forehead but uh, it is wonderful especially for a lot of the birds and smaller little mammalian carnivores like mongoose there's a lot more food around for them now so tomorrow back to your question why do the birds call at night here uh, and through the night where you don't have any in holland where you live making that noise chandra has got another bird there we go a yellow billed hornbill So, there he goes, tomorrow. Um, let me try and think about this for a second. So, well, firstly, I don't know how many nocturnal species outside the owls live in Holland. Um, Holland is a part of the sort of temperate zone, so you don't get great speciation, you don't get a lot of diversity. Also, Holland is a very, very, oh, he's also got a worm, another inchworm. So these are the larvae, probably of butterflies, that are being eaten now. Oh. So tomorrow, I mean, put it this way, uh, we've got more bird species in, uh, in the Sabi sands than they've got in the whole of the United Kingdom. So because of the type of vegetation and stuff that is in temperate or old world Europe, and also the fact that old world Europe is very, very built up, you don't have that many big open spaces. So you're never gonna have that many bird species. I think, I think the only bird, uh, nocturnal bird species I know for sure in Holland that you might actually hear, um, but it's not one you really want to be listening to, is uh, the barn owl. I'll find its call for you guys now. Um, so that is, a, that is a, the one It's definitely there, but that's the only nocturnal I can think of. Here we have a lot of other nocturnal bird species, so if you listen carefully during the night here, uh, you're going to hear normally pearl-spotted owlets, scops owlets, uh, white-faced scops owlets, barred owlets, barn owl, and then Verro's eagle owl and uh, spotted eagle owl, you can potentially hear in an evening. You will normally hear four of those in a night, uh, as well as the different nightjar species. Now, nightjars are a very specific uh, nocturnal bird, so they only come out at night, and that's why you hear them calling. And then also we have thick knees and courses, uh, which are very similar to lapwings or plovers, but they are, are a nocturnal version. 
So we've got a lot more bird species that are active at night. So that's probably why you're hearing uh, more birds at night. Again, that was close. As a, Land Rovers are not well known for, for their doors being very secure. And I, I nearly fell out yesterday. That's two days in a row now. Fortunately, I have cat-like reflexes. So tomorrow, that's probably the main reason. Uh, Jandre is cackling away behind me uh, that you don't hear that many birds at night. It also depends where you are. So, of course, if you're in a very built-up area, um, you're not going to hear many birds at all. But this morning, we had a question. Ah, but we will come back to that question. I did promise to tell about the African version of Bigfoot on the Sunrise Safari, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but Jamie seems to have, or the tech team seems to have beaten Jamie's technological problem. So let's go see what she's got to say or what she's got in store for you on the Sunset Safari. Afternoon, and it does indeed seem as though the tech team has beaten off Wendy's demons for now, gremlins, I mean. Between Alex, Eugene, and Connor, they all frantically were working around Wendy, and she seems to be up and running once again. Now, before I realized that I was going to have to race back to DRC, I'm sure I saw a giraffe somewhere here, but it appears to have disappeared off for now. And just while we were a funny story about while we were waiting to go out and about, we, uh, the, the monkeys managed in the briefest moment during which the storeroom door to our pantry was left open, they managed to get in and ingeniously have now figured out a way of getting around our system, which is to seal everything off in glass jars. And all we heard was the smash of glass and a monkey racing away with a bundle of rusks. Now rusks, for those of you who don't know, or aren't familiar with South African cuisine, is a type of hard biscuit best enjoyed in the mornings with a cup of coffee. Uh, I don't know what, what that monkey was planning on, but he definitely got away with a grand heist this afternoon, leaving poor Dave to clean up the mess since I've got VM on camera with me, so we had to be out as quickly as possible. It just goes to show how ingenious monkeys can really be when it comes to food. And I'm very sorry to poor Jerry in final control, who is devastated by the loss of the rusks. I imagine that there'll be a couple of people in camp who are relatively upset. I must, I must admit I'm going through a bit of a, a rusk break in my life. I went through a stage where that was breakfast every single morning and I've decided that perhaps I'm not that keen on them right now. So sorry, Jerry, the monkeys have got the rusks. We threw the rest of the rusks away, unfortunately. I don't know, you're welcome to get them if you're willing to brave the shards of glass that have probably implanted themselves within it. Definitely wouldn't suggest gastric ulcerations for just a rusk in the morning. The other thing I've got out with is, largely thanks to VM's suggestion, calipers. This is, these are VM's calipers, and we're going out, we're going to find leopard tracks and we're going to measure them. We're going to find leopard tracks that we know which individual is responsible for. And we're going to go measure them down to the millimeter. Uh, I'm, I have to be honest, I, I do some relatively quick, rough conversions in my head but I'm going to have to ask you for help in converting sort of millimeters and centimeters to whatever system would be best in the imperial system. Quarters of an inch and eighths of an inch, and I really honestly don't know how it works from anything smaller than an inch. So you'll have to convert for me or help me convert, and we'll be able to measure each and every, well, no, that's not true. We won't be able to measure each and every single leopard track of the individuals we see, but we will be able to measure the ones that are somewhere on this road. Bim, have I gone past them or I'm still, am I still? Oh, no, they're all the way that way. Ah, oh, they're all the way that way. In that case, let's go all the way that way. Brent was tracking Mbula this morning, whilst Dave and myself were enjoying several elephant sightings towards Biffles Hook Dam. Right, we'll go this way then. 
go and find Mbulu's tracks and measure them. I have a, a friend who studies tracking and their opinion is that you can identify each and every single leopard track by the exact sort of millimeter that it's down to, at least within an area. They say that with 90% accuracy, once they see a track and measure it, they'll be able to tell you which individual that is. That, of course, is substrate dependent. So we can't just measure Mbulu's tracks in the soft sand and assume that it's the same for everything. But I thought it might just be a fun little scientific project. We can keep a chart of the different leopard's track size. You know what I didn't bring, though? It was a, a notebook with a pen and a piece of paper. So perhaps maybe if you guys can keep the records for me, then we can start collecting and collating them. It doesn't have to be restricted to leopards at all, though. We can go and just have a... Because I know that scale is sometimes an issue. We can also go and have a look at some lion tracks and just give you an idea of just how much bigger, down to the millimeter, a lion track is then a leopard track, whether or not it is a male or a female. Sorry guys, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. I wanted to get an update on Tingana. This, this morning I went to check the eastern boundary in order to find out where Tingana had decided to move off to and I'm just listening to that update coming through now. Sounds as though he's wandered across into Chitwa. So he did cross back east, but he crossed back east further to the south of our boundary. So, UK expat, welcome to the Sunset Safari on the subject of our monkeys and their mischief. You were wondering, how does a rusk compare to biscotti? And the answer is it's very similar to biscotti. I'm trying to think exactly what... Generally, rusks tend to be quite large in terms of size. From my knowledge of, bis, of biscotti, they tend to be relatively small pieces, but it's a very similar... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, density? That's not... Texture. Texture. Texture is what I'm going with. <laughs> very, very similar texture and comes in a wide variety of different flavors, depending on whatever your preferences may be. Me, personally, I'm a muesli girl. I like the, the bits of the raisins and the nuts. Some people enjoy buttermilk. I find buttermilk a bit bland. It's definitely a snack that is always interesting to watch people eat. When they first come across, to visit South Africa and they have their first rusk and they don't realize that a rusk, in order not to be molar shattering in terms of how hard it is, it has to be dunked, whether or not you want to, it has to be dunked in coffee or tea and let, allowed to soak. Okay. And Tiana, that's something we do in South Africa as well. You were just saying that rusks in the US are used for teething babies. That South Africans do as well. I'm trying to find a nice spot to show you these tracks that are very much sort of in dappled light, but I think those might be relatively visible. There you go. Here's the male leopard tracks, okay. Armed with the caliper kindly provided by VM. It's set out to measure the size of a male leopard's tracks, and in particular, Mvula's tracks. Here we go. This is what we are going to be utilizing with different measurements. 
increasing a little bit of scientific method. I must just tell you that this was entirely Viem's idea, not myself. Right, we're gonna do, let's think about this properly. We'll do right front foot, back right foot, left front foot, left back foot. That's how we're gonna do it. That will be our method for all future track measuring approaches. So, the right one, let's start with here, just so that you can see it while it's in the sun. How do I know it's the right foot? I'll tell you in a moment. I'm gonna measure first, and then I'll give a bit of a broader description for those of you who are less familiar with leopard tracks. And I'm gonna take it from the furthest point, at least I think that's how I'm going to do it. The furthest point to the furthest point. That seems is the furthest point. Note to self, I need another straight object to help me out here. So his back, oh sorry, his front right foot is 11.6 millimeters. Nope, sorry, 11.8 millimeters. Everybody got that written down? 11.8 millimeters. No, that's not right, centimeters, 11.8 centimeters. This is going very well. His back foot, Mvula's back foot in terms of length is 10.2 centimeters. Okey dokey. The mic died there. Hmm? Still the mic's dying. The mic's dying? Mm. That's unfortunate. Okay, got it back. Okay, got it back. Mm. Cool. When you lean forward. So it's when I lean forward that it goes funny. Okay. Vim is writing the stuff. Are you writing stuff down for me? Yeah, what is the. Uh... First one? <laughs> First one was 11.8 centimeters. Second was 10.2 for his back right. Now, for his left front, and I'll come back and I'll repeat the measurements for you. Now, if I lean forward, am I going to disappear yeah, again? Yeah, off again. Does that help? <laughs> okay. We'll try to do this one-handed at the same time. His back left foot is... That's a little bit... That's interesting. No, that can't be right, surely. Where's that toe? Oh, the toe is there. That's very interesting. So his front left is 11 on the dot centimeters. That's interesting, 0.8, almost a centimeter different to the front. And if we do last one, back left track. Is 10.4. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, so male leopard tracks, a female's tracks would be about half that size. And we've got, although it's not clearly visible, he's walking relatively fast. His back track's falling quite far from his front tracks. So walking at a sort of medium fast walking speed. I'm not gonna stick down there for too long just because I'm not sure if you're able to hear me while I lean forward. So what did we get? Interesting. His right front foot, let me get in while I talk to you just so I can be, hear your questions and your comments about this at the same time. Bear with me one second. So, okay. So his right front is considerably bigger than his left front. And I almost feel as if we should do width as well. But we could be here all day if we get that specific. So his right front is 0.8 centimeters larger than his back track on the right. Oh, sorry, then his left track on the front. But his back left track is 0.2 millimeters larger than his right back. It's a bit confusing. But there you go. We shall forever know what <laughs> in Willer's tracks shall be, or what size in Willer's tracks are in soft soil substrate. That's an important one to remember. Soft sand substrate, let's put it that way. I'm sure you'd also like to go and track this leopard and not just measure his feet. 
which is what we are going to try and do. The traps are not fresh, fresh uh, from probably last night sometime, but they are heading roughly in this direction, which is where I'm going to go eventually. Oh no, actually they're not. They've crept straight across to this block here. Going back as well? Oh, now that's interesting. Why is he pacing like that? Ah, I see them. Going that way as well. So he didn't pick a direction really, did he? Hmm. Okay. I'm trying to just see if which track is on top of which. Which ones are fresher than which tracks. Pardon? You tracked him that way this morning. You tracked him that way this morning? Oh, so Vula came out sometime last while we were not on air. How ah, very interesting. tracks here. Let's just see if he doesn't pop out at the junction. Is this him here or is it Hyena? I'm not tall enough. Cool. Definitely not tall enough for tracking on the left hand side of the car without getting off. Brent always shouts at me if I miss tracks on my left hand side but you know when you're at least a foot shorter than someone else it is a bit more difficult. Let's just check this junction properly. So, Tammy who's watching in Indiana, she's been reading up on melanistic animals and would like to know why it is that we talk about black leopards but yet there cannot be black lions. And the answer is, Tammy, I was just trying to remember, the melanistic gene is carried by all but 11 members of the panthera genus out of, genus out of something or the cat family out of about 37 different members i have to remember the exact number but essentially not all animals carry that melanistic gene it just hasn't come in to their gene programming so that melanistic gene it's a recessive gene has come from most likely either a, muta a mutation in the animal's DNA, whether it has come from an addition of a base sequence or a deletion of a base sequence, or whatever has happened there that changed it. And it just hasn't come through in all of the cat species. So there's no reason why there's something different about lions as opposed to leopards. That means that they can't be melanistic. For example, you get leucistic lions, the white lions, and you get leucistic leopards in the form, or fairly leucistic leopards in the form of a strawberry colored leopard that Tara Priri has written quite a few articles on. So there's, it's just that in some way that has caused it to happen. It has never, ever, ever been recorded except on Photoshop. Um, there's lots of photoshopped black lines, melanistic lines, but there is no such thing as a melanistic line gene. They don't, they haven't carried it before. The only chance you would maybe get of a melanistic line or some kind of gene entering that sequence is if we played around with it. If we entered the genes, um, so basically what I mean by that is if we the line with another member of the panthera order or panthera genus I'm trying to think this through now in a way that answers your question properly if we started breeding it's it's a it's a tough one you know the creation of ligers 
and tigons and all those abnormalities. And they are relatively, most of the time they've been forced by human interference, those mixes between lions and tigers. I was trying to think if maybe you could breed a lion with another melanistic animal and might start getting it to come through. But it would take a huge amount of human interference. Whereas the leucistic gene is very much a dominant gene within the, the lion population, or it's a gene that comes through in the lion population. And of course, there's that amazing incidence where most of the white lions are in the Timbavati region. That's the area that is famous for them. Just doing a loop, by the way. Keep your eyes peeled from Bula because he's obviously been wandering about between drives. Um, but and yet, and yet, these are the freshest tracks. These are actually oh no, they've been driven over there. I can see Brent's footprints up and down and up and down from tracking this morning. Um, and yet somehow, randomly, the white lion gene came through in Singita, which is all the way on Singita Lobombo, which is all the way on the eastern side of the Kruger National Park. So it is distinctly possible that the white lion gene shows through, but it is, it is absolutely impossible to, or it has certainly never been recorded and lions have never been found to even carry the recessive gene that causes melanism. It's just a ge genetically distinct animal from jaguars and leopards. It's the same reason why the king cheetah gene is isolated to the cheetah as a species. There's nothing else like that in any of the other big cats, at least that causes that kind of mutation with the thickening of the spots and the stripes on the, che on the king cheetahs. to the Sunset Safari. You were wondering, since we're going to be traversing cheetah plains over the next few weeks, something of course that we're all enormously excited about, you were wondering if I could explain a little bit about the terrain there, and if it's more open, for example, than Juma, what the differences might be, and what individual leopards and lions we might see. So Rob, first of all, yes, it has, it has sections that are very similar to the woodland bush that we're looking at at the moment the sort of bush willow woodland. So uh, uh, quite a few spaces within that are very, very similar. There is the extraordinary three in the row pan, which is a pumped series of three pans that is especially productive for wildlife sightings. And that being said, on the eastern side of Cheetah Plains, it is dominated by gabbro rock layers and soil layers which give rise to large natural open grassland. And that's what's really, really exciting, I think, for all of us, is the possibility of more cheetah sightings, because the cheetah do tend to spend more time in those open grassland areas. The possibility of quarry busted, secretary birds, the more clearing-oriented clearing animals. Now, that's something that's gonna be ridiculously exciting for us also wondering a little bit about the different individual animals. I believe that is it Shimbambalan that hangs out there, but also most definitely Konuma and Quarantine are spotted in that area far more often than they come on to Juma. The Birmingham boys spend or have spent an inordinate amount of time on Cheetah Plains around three in a row pan, so they very much enjoy that area, they like that area. The Styx females are probably more likely to be seen on that side. I'm sure I'm missing a leopard here. There's one in particular that I think I've forgotten. But uh, that's the one I'm thinking of, Inkanyeni. Inkanyeni and her two cubs 
also a leopard that we could expect to see on cheetah plains and that is exceptionally exciting her cubs are now what are they they're about four months old they must be or close to four months old close to four by the time we get there it will be they'll be four and a half months old and they can but very often regularly seen in that area so exciting times lie ahead i just want to check triple m to see if mvula hasn't crossed out of that block we stuck on buyatella really carefully it's so interesting look to say that it's in Buller's tracks I think is correct I think that they are a little bit too small for Tingana's footprint that being said um, it's not necessarily an absolute so we're assuming that it's in Buller's tracks we don't know for a hundred percent certain so it could be Tingana that we're tracking it seems unlikely though especially since Tingana has been tracked all the way to Chitwa which is far south of where we are and those tracks are from last night sometime the tracks that we saw initially walking south along the road then there's fresher tracks that have come out question from Kathy about Karula's now reaction to Kunuma and quarantine her two older sons from a previous litter and Kathy was wondering now that Karula has cubs would she be more likely to turn away Kunuma and quarantine so she has in the past allowed them even after they've left home or dispersed a little bit she still allowed them to come and meet up with her she's occasionally shared kills with them not in my time here but she has been known to do it kathy yes she is more likely to turn penuma and quarantine away that being said there are lots of records of um, several generations or two generations of cubs litters feeding or sharing a kill that belongs to their mother leopards cannot necessarily be specifically defined their responses to each other cannot necessarily be defined by a set structure of rules so whilst i think that karula would most likely respond by trying to get away or to chase away kunuma and quarantine there's a chance she could end up sharing a kill with them they could end up babysitting the cubs it has been recorded to happen and i actually think that it's been recorded by Karula's previous offspring. There's a centipede. There you go, guys. There's my least favorite animal ever. Those of you who know, well done, Viam. Look at that. It's quite a large centipede. I'm going to get out, much against my initial instinct to give you a sense of scale that's how big he is off he goes bright green and red colored almost christmas themed I'm trying to see if i can see what track he left behind because that would be quite cool but he's actually so light and the light is so dappled that he hasn't really left much of a track those of you who know me well know that centipedes are probably my least favorite animal out here i'm not proud of it but i do have a slight um shiver when i encounter centipedes <laughs> i mean it is it's a little bit ridiculous because i've never ever ever been bitten by one and they are venomous and their bites apparently hurt oh no that's not true actually i have been bitten by one sorry i'm talking rubbish i have been bitten by one collecting firewood once the bites do burn 
and there are the larger species can carry venom that if you have a nasty reaction to can make you quite ill so that was a centipede we so often see millipedes but we hardly ever see their centipede cousins centipedes of course being uh, voracious predators very very rapid moving capable of taking down prey and in fact there's it's the one species that one interesting sort of relationship with the scorpion where the scorpion will feed on the centipede and the centipede might feed on the scorpion it just depends on who has the size advantage at the time millipedes totally different very poisonous to eat so toxic you can't eat them but they can't bite you and they feed off vegetable matter and i don't know i'm sorry i don't know what it is about centipedes i have complete respect for them i think they're beautiful but they must be at arm's length from me but I, that's just a personal it's my one personal little weakness in the bush we won't tell anyone though if you wouldn't mind keep that a secret Here's these tracks here. That's incredible. Raisa says that from what she remembers, Duna, one of Karula's previous cubs, had a front track of 11 centimeters by the time he was two years old. That's really interesting. That is very, very impressive. By the way, his tracks have just popped out of this block here. And this is where it becomes difficult because it's a main road. They have been driven over multiple times. So I'm just trying to check and see whether or not they've gone off into Arethusa or whether he has just walked south down the road. That's interesting. To and I, I wonder how much of a difference the substrate will play. Obviously, the speed of running, it's going to spread the track out further. It's going to make it look far bigger than just normally walking. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Duna has dispersed now. Dispersed now. Duna has moved out of our area and away from the, his, the territory of his mom. Thing. Sorry, I'm just listening to the game drive comms again. I've still got, I've still got traces of toes of some kind of paw print, but I can't tell if they're his or if they're hyenas. What I'll do is, I'll do one last check around here, see if he hasn't cut through that side, and then I'll check in with the Arethusa guides, see if I can't get any info. Let me just do that when we get up to those sign boards there. Check in and see if they've picked up any signs of his tracks. Standing by. Brent, I've only picked them up about 200 meters south of the valley. He's um, Most of them. Check all the way down Zoe's right down to Gowrie Main. I uh, will choose a guide so I can't see where they've gone off the road or if they've gone off the road. Some of the tracks that came out on Balanites Road looked very fresh. I don't know if you missed them. I think you might have just moved in the middle of the day. Okie dokie. Let us go and see if we can figure out if Vimbula has decided to come onto Arethusa. 
How interesting is it that he has moved in such towards such unusual areas? Uh, just to relay that conversation, Brent and myself just checking in and planning a search for him. Uh, I've got Brent checking all the way down south along the western, uh, well, sort of just one road in from the western boundary that we found his tracks on in case he comes back on. Brent was a bit worried that he's missed the tracks, but I don't think so. I think that those tracks were from earlier today. Oh, sorry, hold on. Jackson's picked up tracks on Gary Main. Oh, friend trying to talk to me. I couldn't hear what on earth he said there. He disappeared. Ah oh, well, somebody's already having a conversation. Okay, that's our plan. I think that Brent is going to check up on the tracks that Taxon has found on Gary Main. We're going to check really carefully along the parallel road north, see if he hasn't come in this side. I just need to catch up with some of the Arethusa guides, find out if they have any updates for me while I do that. Let's hear what Brent's been up to. Welcome back. Uh, sorry about that. We disappeared uh, to do some uh, virtual reality stuff, some exciting stuff. That field of butterflies, we took the rig off and put it in the middle of the butterflies. Hopefully it works. So we'll see how that comes out. So, some updates while we've been gone. So Jamie's found the mail tracks that we were following this morning and he's moved during the day towards the Arethusa boundary. But now, on top of my tracks from this morning, there are female leopard tracks, which we think are Karulas. So, Taxon is in the area, and we're gonna have a little gander down that way, see if there's anything to be found. But I think I, I'm gonna stick to our original plan, is we're not really looking for anything, because that seems to be the best way to find everything. So let's just see what wonders the African bushveld has for us this evening. So this morning, just before the end of the sunrise safari, Andy and Julie in Los Angeles uh, wanted to know if there were any African equivalents of the big foot. So in Southern Africa, not really, no, but in West Africa, there is one. It's called the Kulikamba. Now, the Kulikamba is said to be sort of a half chimp, half gorilla that lives on the edge of the Ferdin Vaz. Now, the Ferdin Vaz is a massive lagoon system that comes off the Agoe River uh, in Gabon. It's a massive area of swamp forest uh, and mainland forest. Lots of gorillas, lots of chimpanzees, lots of forest elephants, lots and lots of stuff. Now, there is an old um, Miene, which is the, the tribe from that area, story about this creature called a Kulikamba. Now, it is said to be bipedal, so it goes along quite along with the the, the Bigfoot, uh, and incredibly strong and much more intelligent than gorillas or chimpanzees. And it is said to be able to kill a person. Uh, if it, they find them, they're supposed to be quite aggressive. Now, there's lots of weird and wonderful stories that come out of rainforest because there's, uh, the original people, apart from the pygmies, didn't really push very deep into the forests. So I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a French man I met, a very nice man, who, while I was living in Gabon, who completely believed in Kulikamba. And uh, he spent quite a lot of time in the Ferdin Vaz, fishing and doing all sorts of things. And he was convinced that there was definitely, it was there, it exists, and he's got proof. 
Now, we were with people who've known him for quite a, a long while, and they sort of rolled their eyes slightly, and I should have taken note. So, <laughs> off he goes into his storeroom and comes out with this bags of bones to prove about the Kuli Kamba. Now, basically, <laughs> he had a, a variation of different chimp and gorilla bones that he was trying to mix together to create this bipedal upright thing. So you basically had a gorilla skull with chimp vertebrae or, or a chimp skull with gorilla vertebrae. And uh, if you've done any sort of uh, biology or anatomy, it just doesn't work. But uh, he is 100% he is convinced. He even spent a huge amount of money sending this off to <laughs> uh, ape experts around the world in France and Switzerland and the States with explaining how the different things uh, put, got put together. And each one of the different experts sent him a very kindly email back saying, Dear sir, you are sending us a mixture of chimpanzee and gorilla bones. But to this day, he still firmly believes uh, the Kuli Cumber exists. I don't, but I would be ecstatic to find out if it did. It would be wonderful to find a new great ape species, but I, I think it's not going to happen. Jean-Dre thinks it exists. He's nodding. He's like, there's a Kuli Cumber. I think Jean-Dre wants to go find it. Yeah, Jean-Dre, we could go make a movie looking for Kuli Cumber. <laughs> Jean-Dre has a big smile on his face. He likes that idea. I know jean would love to get up to Gabon, beautiful part of the world. But you do have to get used to being bitten by every form of insect under the sun. Oh, right, you don't even see the sun in the rainforest. But it is a beautiful, beautiful place. A very challenging place to work, but uh, extremely interesting. An amazing diversity of species, specifically insects. So we've got this exquisite afternoon light. And now let's try find something with a heartbeat to put on it. I think if I ask Chandra to film another butterfly, I might get whack, a whack on the back of the head. Uh, so let's find him a wasp to film. <laughs> Just joking, Chandra. OK, let's go find some stuff. Mary in Michigan uh, seems to think Jean-Dre is a great tracker and leopard spotter. Uh, he is. He's getting there. We've still got a bit more training to do, but definitely as a spotter. But uh, really incredible that our whole staff got to spend some time with Renius and Klongo recently. And I know everyone in our team thoroughly enjoyed having a closer look at the intricacies of tracking. Wisconsin uh, seems to think that the cameramen find the animals far uh, more than the presenters. And there's a big thumbs up from Jandre. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I thought they were calling me. Yeah, check the uh, Sorry about that, just listening to where everyone's checking. So there's a few reasons. Uh, the cameramen sit quite a bit higher than us, which is a, a really nice advantage. And obviously, it's beneficial for all of us that they can spot the animals. But I would like to wager money on that I'll spot more animals than the cam ops. Would you like to take a wager on this, Jean-Dre? So we're going to have a bet. Who can spot the most animals between the cameraman and the presenter? Hello, everyone. Hello, Michael. Hey. How's everyone doing? Good, thank you. Not too bad. Don't get lost now. I'll try not to. I've got a question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, guys. So, uh, Mike, uh, who's Candace's husband from Juma, is out on game drive with a few friends. And some of the friends are also friends of mine who I used to work with. Uh, and one I actually went to school with from when we were six years old. No, five years old. So, nice to see them out and about. But so, 
Bet's on, jean -Dre. Here we go. So let's just lay some ground laws here. Now, are we including Impala? Everything. Are we? OK. Why don't you guys, why don't you guys lay the ground laws for us? What are the rules for the, the competition between co-ops and the guiding team when it comes to spotting animals? So I just heard a whole bunch of ox pickers take off, and quite often there's an animal around when that happens. Could be buffalo. We did have quite a few. There's dust. Something's going on there. Um, I can just see dust coming out of the, the bush there. Now, is it a buffalo? Yes, it's a buffalo who is rolling. There we go. I was just, I was hoping it was something else, but there's some very old buffalo bulls through that gap there, and I think they were just having a rub, and it disturbed the oxpeckers. Here we go. I think it's the same gentleman we saw towards the end of the sun set, sunrise safari. They were in this area. There we go. So why don't you guys set the rules? Uh, let's make it relatively simple. Uh, do we spot all animals or only members of the sort of more interesting and big, so sort of buffalo, lion, elephant, um, hippo, or do we include impala, stenbok, everything? And I think just to keep it much easier, we'll stick to mammals. So no birds, no reptiles, but no butterflies. No butterflies. <laughs> no butterflies. So no insects, no reptiles, no birds. Uh, we'll stick to the mammals. And let's put a time on it. OK, well, it is 5 p.m. now, or two minutes past 5. So we're not going to let it dominate everything, so we'll just do it for the next half an hour. OK, let's go. Only mammals, half an hour. Dun, 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 dun. Now jean is standing up to get a higher view than even when he's sitting down. But there's ways to deal with this. I just hit the brakes very hard, and he might join me in the front. OK, so we are going to give a hand in searching uh, for that female leopard, so I will be looking for tracks as well. Wildebeest. Oh, there we go. Jean-Dre is standing up high, and he has spotted a wildebeest. I can't... OK, is this how we're going to play now? There we go. Well spotted, Jean-Dre, of wildly beast. Hello, mister. So one point to Jandre. Why are we still looking at the wildebeest, Jandre? So it looks like it's that male. Let me just go back a bit. So it's going to be quite interesting because the, the rutting season for wildebeest is going to be um, starting quite soon. So this male's, although he's in a little bit of a thicket there at the moment, He's got quite a nice territory because he's got a, a little pan below us, a nice open short grass area that'll attract the ladies. And his wildebeest are very, very specific builders. Impala. Behind the wildebeest. No. Yes? No. There's an impala behind the wildebeest. No. OK, so as I was saying, he's got himself a really nice little, nice little territory here. So the females are going to be brought in specifically as it gets a bit dry, drier. And uh, he'll defend this little territory against all the other wildebeest bulls. So hopefully we will be starting to see some of those big herds. And it's really fascinating behavior during that ratting, watching those males panic around and try keep those ladies inside their territory. But the ladies will move through diff multiple male territories, so mating with multiple males sometimes. And that helps with genetic diversity. So that's very interesting, and it's going to be fun to watch when the rat starts. So there's going to be two other species. Of course, we know all about the impala rat. But there's another species that rats that people don't know about too much. Uh, I have chatted about it a bit this last couple of weeks, and that's warthog. So we will be keeping an eye out for all that interesting mating behavior over the next little while. So we're going to go head off slightly more to the south while we do that. 
Let's go see what Jamie's up to. Look at how beautiful this grass is. Now, it's funny, this is the first time I've actually had a chance to get to know the different grass species of the Sabi Sands area that I've st I started working here last year, July, and it was in midwinter, so there was no grass. Then we had the drought, so there was no grass. So this is the first time I'm seeing the inflorescences, so the reproductive parts of the grass, as clearly. Now, I'm fairly certain this is a type of signal grass. I used to know all of the grasses where I used to work, but this is a new one for me. I have to go and double check exactly what it is. It's got the most beautiful red color to it. I do have my grass book somewhere, so I will look that up. It looks as though it's quite a hardy species. Maybe one of the pioneer grass species. And the reason I say that is just because it's on quite an eroded part of Red Dam's dam wall. Now, just have a look at how full Red Dam is. This is probably the most water I've ever seen here. Again, when I arrived, it was basically empty. I had a sighting with Karula and Tingana on the other side of this dam wall mating. And we were able to drive right through to the other side. I don't know if many of you must remember that afternoon. It was an extraordinary afternoon where Tingana, Tingana and Karula had been mating but feeding off a dead buffalo that was in the drainage line at the same time. It was just a little bit in towards this drainage line. And we went back to go and find Tingana and Karula that afternoon, Viam and myself. We found Tingana just here. And then we drove a little bit further up towards where the buffalo carcass was, thinking Karula was going to be there. And there was the Salala Pride sitting, having obviously decided to start scavenging off that buffalo themselves. Then Karula appeared on the scene and we had the mating on the dam wall right in front of us with the other vehicle with guests on it looking straight up at them. It must have been the most incredible eye-level view for those guests. And then Tingana and Karula promptly walking back towards the buffalo carcass without realizing the Salala pride was there. And at that moment there was absolute chaos. There was growling. The young Salala males chased Karula and Tingana in this direction. Karula, I think, went up. Which tree did she go up? I think she went up that funny little knob thorn over there. Yes, it was there, it was on that corner, because we slid, we rolled forward and went underneath her while she was looking for, looking towards the Salala Pride. So we had two mating leopards and an entire lion pride in one afternoon. It was most incredible, one of the most incredible sightings that we've had here at Red Dam, it must have been. to Inshan, who is watching us on YouTube for the very first time. And it's interesting that we've had this conversation this morning as well as this afternoon. But Inshan would like to know, do we ever see any jaguars? Well, Inshan, no, we don't. Um, but we do see a very close relative of theirs, the leopard. It's basically the National Park area. At the moment, specifically, we have our little area on Arethusa and Juma in the Sabi Sand, portion of 4 million hectares worth of unfenced wilderness area. Our jaguars, we did speak about this this morning, are more based towards South and Central America, with our jefe, the jaguar being seen in Arizona just recently. And I even touched on the subject this morning, saying that I wouldn't be surprised if there are more jaguars wandering around the southern U.S. without any And with people not realizing for years and years, there was a leopard that denned in the drainage um, pipe of a big sports stadium, the Ellis Park Sports Stadium in Johannesburg, a few years ago. There's also a leopard that made her way into an abandoned block of apartments in Pretoria. So two of our biggest cities 
or to one of the biggest seas in South Africa, and we had leopards wandering about there. And just like them, I think that jaguars have quite a similar ability to remain stealthy and undetected. Of course, the difference with jaguars is that a bit bigger and a bit stockier than the leopards that we see here. Whereas out here in the African bush, our apex predator, not counting man, of course, but we still see both lions and stick with us. You will at some point see both leopards and lions on our show. Don't forget, we do this twice a day, every day. It will always be two, usually two of us, unless we have encountered a major problem, doing drives for you and finding as many wonderful animals as we possibly can. And the awesome thing about it is that it is alive. So what that means is anything that's happening on your screens is happening in real life in real time in south africa however many miles away i'm not sure where you're from but either way we are the current events are, that are happening on your screen are but in theory fortunately that's been made somewhat tricky by multiple passive vehicles on a main that use it. It's also used by various delivery trucks and vehicles. And I just wanted to check this block really, really carefully, or this road really carefully, to see that he hasn't decided to pop out somewhere here. No updates on the Game Drive channel, by the way, from Arathula. And it seems as though most people are quite far away from where we are, so. Well, now we are on our own on our leopard tracking mission. And of course out here, always the chance that we could encounter Shadow. Shadow being Karula's daughter. I spoke about Karula before. She's known as the Queen of Juma. Her daughter Shadow, this is right in the center of her territory. And she also happens to have cubs. That means we're not gonna go looking for her in drainage lines and such places. But there's always the chance that we might bump into her. Just wondering if these Impala might perhaps know where she is. The most common antelope species out here. And as such, an antelope species that is constantly on alert, since it's on pretty much every predator's menu, except perhaps dwarf mongoose. Uh, I can't imagine a dwarf mongoose attempting to tackle a full-grown impala. <laughs> Sorry, I've been distracted by that bizarre image now in my head. This morning I stopped at a herd of impala. It's one of the funniest things that has ever happened to me, or the strangest things that's ever happened to me on drive. Um, impala allow a bird called an ox picker to sit on their backs and to feed off the ticks and the parasites that gather there. And this morning, the impala got a fright when we stopped and they ran off and they disturbed the ox pickers that were sitting on their backs. And the ox picker came probably within five inches of flying straight into my head. It was, I've never had that happen before. It was absolutely hilarious. Unfortunately, Dave was busy looking at the impala on the left. He had no idea that that was going to happen. I certainly didn't. But we didn't manage to get it live on camera. But that is the closest I've come to being injured by a, essentially by a herd of impala, albeit through the motions of an ox picker. I had a really, really close up view of his tail feathers as he banked upwards. I'm not sure though who got more of a fright, whether it was me or the ox picker. What are you two doing? They were up to something as I drove past these Cape turtle doves. I don't know what it was. They looked like they might have been involved in a little bit of a scuffle. They look like they're up to no good, don't they? Mm, pretending to be casual, but I know better. They were definitely up to something. Just an interesting aside. This is a bird, the dove, or the, the dove is always associated in Western cultures with, as a bird of peace, a symbol of peace and love. 
released at weddings, which I've always found quite a bizarre concept, but nevertheless something that is released into the sky when people get married. Out here, local customs, the dove is a symbol of war or conflict, the complete opposite, because they are capable of having such savage fights between two males. Instead, here the bird of peace is the lilac-breasted roller, another bird that we very commonly see. Just a random piece of information. It's also a bird. The lilac-breasted roller is probably the most attractive bird, or one of the most attractive birds out here, with the worst call, the most unmelodious, jarring, screeching call. We spoke yesterday about our favorite bird calls and I asked the viewers what their favorite bird calls were. I think we, we failed to touch on the other side of that coin, our worst bird calls. Like this one's quite a jarring call. Okay, top five worst bird calls. Vultures have got to go up to the top. Crowned lapwings quite high up, like the one that we're looking at at the moment. Lilac-breasted rollers. Mm. Hardy dogs is quite a good one. It has been number one. Hardy, you want to make hardy dogs number one, Viam? Okay. I don't know, though. Vultures are... Vultures is a pretty terrifying sound. Vultures sound like screeching dinosaurs. There's one more bird I want to show you, just while we're here. Not a bird with an offensive call and a lovely bird never the never mind he's gone now, i think the reason <laughs> it was a it was a hoopoo by the way hello i'm sure you have a nest here somewhere but i promise i'm not coming to squish it oh, oh so cross a sound as a child. Oh, it's loud. I associated with being dive bombed and possibly with my head being picked. Sure. Uh, we spoke about bird tracks. I'm going to shout over this lapwing's call. We spoke about identifying bird tracks and I mentioned that with ground birds. It's okay. I promise. Oh, my word. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Why did you put it there? Why on earth? There you go, Vim. Definitely winning a competition that I wasn't willing to enter into with him. This is why we are getting into so much trouble. All right, all right, all right, all right. Why did you put it in such a stupid place, you silly bird? Right next to a road. Okay, shall we leave this poor, poor parent lapwing to protect the eggs? I think I'm quite scared that it's going to come savage us. All right, okay, 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 we're going, we're going, we're going, I promise. Shame, sorry. Whew. Just clear my eardrum quickly. Interesting, isn't it? Instant cut off that sound. Uh, it always astounds me how crowned lapwings build nests like that. Right out in the open, you saw how camouflaged those eggs are, so beautifully camouflaged, but just imagine an entire herd of elephants walking down that road and on either side. Oh, it's an interesting choice of nesting technique. Why not just put it, I don't know, like at the base of a bush somewhere? I'm sure that would be more sensible. Now that, if I'd got out now and I'd gone to potentially threaten their nest, which of course I was never going to do, but if I had, what that crowned lapwing would have done is, first of all, it would have screeched and dive-bombed at me to try and send me on my way. If that hadn't worked, it would have played the broken, you know how ducks do? So pretending to have a broken wing, certain species of ducks anyway, pretending to have a broken wing. So running along with a wing out like this as a distraction technique to draw the predator's attention away from the nest and the bird
birds away as far as possible before the birds miraculously recover and fly away. It's a clever little technique that they've got going on. And that I think would have been the next step after shouting at me like that. I th I'm positively deaf now. Sure. Okay, very silly place to put their nest. Right on the side of the road. I will let people know, by the way. Hopefully the screeching of the crowned lapwings will alert people to the presence of it. Sure. Interesting. Now, it's interesting about the, the, the crowned lapwings and other ground nesting birds. Crowned lapwings, blacksmith lapwings. Now, in most countries, insulating a nest would be the most important thing about nesting, using the body heat to incubate the eggs. Now, out here, the African sun does a perfectly good job of incubating the eggs all to themselves. On hot summer days, or even hot autumn days, today must have been at least over. opposite approach to most birds in a more temperate climate as opposed to ours. Okay, I don't think this leopard has come out this way. Aha! Now, this is a wonderf wonderful news. It seems as though Brent has been tracking hard, and he has been for the last two days. Let's go and see the fruits of his labor, finally. The Queen of Juma herself. So guys, Jandre and I have of course put our spotting competition on hold for the Queen of Juma. And what a spectacular sight. She's up in a tree. Uh, we actually didn't find her ourselves. We were helping track her, but Taxon has found her. And she does have a kill with her as well. So that's excellent news. So if we go into that shadow underneath that big marula there, that big marula bow, sorry. Oh, she's popped her head over now. So if we go up slightly, you can just see the diker in the shadow there. Looks like she's got a young diker above her. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Okay, I think... Oops, you nearly dropped it. Lucky there's no hyenas around. Started alarm calling at it. So this is the reason the tracks have been going to and fro. I must have walked so close to her about three times yesterday. But there's a possibility she might have been with the cubs, so not here. You know, she's eating the diker's nose at the moment. Just trying to think where we can move. Unfortunately, at the moment, this is our best spot, so we're going to stick with it. So I know all of you are as happy as me to catch up with the Queen of Juma in magnificent light. Good to see she's got a meal. Nice marula tree that she's in. And you can see how difficult it is to spot them from a distance. Now, 
And this particular area is where I was playing hide from the buffalo yesterday. Should we have a look from over here, jean -Dre? We're just going to have a quick look. So Julianne, who's watching on YouTube, is wondering, when will the cubs begin to eat meat? Uh, normally at about three months or so, maybe even a little bit younger sometimes. But it shouldn't be too long now. OK, well, let's just try and sneak through, see if we can get it. How's that, Chandra? There we go. No branch in the way. So what this means is the cubs are still to the south of us because we've had tracks to and from, to and from, to and from. This morning, I must have had three different sets of her tracks crossing the southern boundary. But of course, she's still utilizing this area to hunt. And hopefully, she's going to bring those little ones back to Juma soon. So I haven't seen whether it's a male or female diker just yet that she's caught. Now, Karula really likes diker and stenbok. Those are her sort of two preferred prey species. It looks like she's going to move us into an awkward spot for us again. Let's just try and go around a little bit more. that, Chandra? Will that do? Oh, isn't that beautiful? If you guys hear that clickety-click, sorry, that's just me. Such a beautiful sight, I can't resist but click off a few shots. If you listen carefully, you can even hear her crunching. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So Laura in Happy Valley is saying, you ha Brent, you said you had three sets of her tracks to and from across the road this morning, but she's wondering, how do you track an animal through the bush and on the grass? With great difficulty, Laura. <laughs> That's probably why I didn't find her. So at the moment, the ground's very hard. It is quite difficult to see the tracks. And fortunately, we have found her, but oh, I'm a bit frustrated. I should have found her yesterday. I was just looking a little bit too far to the east. I was probably about 100 meters away, checking all the big marula trees in the block on the other side of Weaver's Nest. Oh, look at that. She's about to move it, and it is a male diker. A leopard has. 
incredible climber. So she'll come here, she'll feed on this diker kill before returning to feed on the cubs. So she's generally going to be hunting in an area quite close to where her den site is. At the moment, we're pretty confident that her den site is on the other side of the main access road, Gowry Main. So within a property called Little Gowry. But hopefully she will be moving that den site soon. to get a better view. Oh, sorry, not to get a better view, to get a better grip, a better place to feed. So Zinc on YouTube is asking, is she used to the people in the vehicles? She seems to look over, but doesn't seem too perturbed at all. Well, Zinc, she's very used to vehicles, not so much people. I don't believe she sees the individual people in each of the vehicles. Uh, she does know the vehicles there, and she has been followed by them since she was a small cub. But as long as you drive respectfully and carefully around, she's not going to react badly to the vehicles. Obviously, if you drive too close or you drive too fast, uh, then she might react, but if we keep our distance and keep our respect, it's going to be just like this. She's going to carry on with her natural life as she would if we weren't here. Len in Virginia is wondering where does the name Karula come from and if they are, does it mean anything? Now, Karula is the peaceful one. It is the Shangan word for peaceful. And that's where the name comes from. Although she doesn't look completely peaceful eating the poor diker. But uh, if you're a diker, she's definitely not a peaceful one. And Len's also asking about the other names of leopards. They have different meanings. Bless you, Jean-Dre. And of course, lots of different meanings. Uh, like Mvula means the rain. Tingana means the shy one. Tanda, Tandi means the loved one. Andre, should we try to get onto the other side of the light? Are you happy where we are? Now uh, we're going to stay here. Jandre thinks this is going to be the best view for us. So Gracie, who's eight years old and a very firm, staunch Safari Live fan, is watching with her grandfather for the first time today. 
and her grandpa asked, is it going to fall out of the tree? To which Gracie re re replied, no, silly grandpa, she's very good at trees and she's the queen of this area. That's right, Gracie. Uh, Karula is particularly good in the trees. Like most leopards, they are designed to be able to climb incredibly well. And I don't think we're ever going to see Karula fall from a misstep, maybe a stumble or two, but I don't think she's ever going to fall out of a tree. You can see that late afternoon light is getting better and better. Look at this, it is just wonderful. Sorry guys, I'm just a little bit distracted. One of the vehicles got stuck. <laughs> and Taxon was just helping him move out. Let's just try to get another view of it from the other side. There are a lot of vehicles who want to come see her, but we will come back a little later once the pandemonium has calmed down. I don't think anyone seems to have seen a leopard. It is also Easter weekend, so lots of people about. Let's just try to get another view from the other side. Oh dear, if my car just, oh, there you go. So Aiden, who's in Canada, is wondering how much food does a leopard need to eat to s each day to survive? Well, Aiden, they don't normally eat every day, normally once every two or three days. And, and a meal like this little diker will be plenty enough to keep her going for a couple of days. She'll probably have to f sorry, feed more regularly. I forgot about the aerial for a second there. Uh, while she's got cubs, just so she can keep producing milk. But uh, so normally every, she'll probably be feeding every two to three days at the moment. Just wait for Andrew to finish moving. So guys, we try only keep one vehicle moving in a sighting at a time. So it looks like Andrew's trying to get out of here. So I'm just going to wait for him to stop moving. There we go. How's that for you, Jandra? Here we go. Sorry, guys, just got to be on the game drive for a second. Look at that. She's making short work of that little diker. So we don't have too long, guys, before she, before we have to move out because there are quite a few vehicles standing by, and we are nice, so we do share because 
that's how we do it, our chair. So Susan in Florida is wondering, is she turning her head to the side like that uh, to use her carnassal teeth to shear the meat? Actually, she's using her premolars at the moment, Susan. She's using them to crush the soft nasal bones of the diker. So she'll be feeding off the stuff that's in the nasal cavity. There we go, you can see. And she's using her premolars to actually break the bone off there. And she is chewing bits of bone, soft bone. She'll be able to eat quite easily. Oh, look at her. Isn't she beautiful? So you see, even while she's feeding, she's very alert. So she is in the shadow at the moment of the tree. You can see the golden light behind her. So it pays to be very alert. So there could be hyenas coming in. So she'll always stop, listen, and look while she's feeding every now and then. You can actually hear the bones crunching. So there's an aeroplane flying over. So if you hear that noise, Don't worry about it. So you can actually see the eye socket of the diker there. Uh, quite often, eyes, uh, the eyes will be eaten quite, quite one of the first things that will be eaten. And other than that, the, first, the very first things that will be eaten are the, the liver, lungs, kidneys, and heart. Of course, Specifically, the liver is quite sought after, high iron content, lots of nutrients if you're a leopard. So at the moment, she's probably going to chew right through and open the brain cavity. On the small antelope like this, she's going to be able to break open uh, that. On bigger antelope, she wouldn't be able to. See how she's trying to get her molars and premolars in there now, right to the back to be able to crush uh, those, those soft bones in the face of the diker. So quite often, all that will be left of a kill like this uh, will be the skull cap. So that really thick top part of the skull where the horns are. OK, Joanny would like to know will, what will Karula do when she's finished with the carcass. She'll just let the little bits fall. Uh, if a hyena does happen to find this, it'll feed off those little bits of bone. But sometimes the carcass can stay in the tree. Look at that, turning her head right to the side. But mostly those bits of carcass, as she's finished with them, will fall. On a small antelope like this, she'll eat almost the whole leg um, so all the bones she'll crush up to try to get to the marrow. Uh, it's only on bigger animals that she might struggle to do that. Sorry, guys, I just need to listen to the Game Drive channel. Jan, how many other vehicles are still standing by after you?
How many other how many other standbys are after you, hun? And that's it. Oh, Ephraim. Oh, from Jacobin. Okay. Oh, look at that, see your head. And I was up checking around, making sure nothing's about. So it's amazing. I think they'll be able to hear that crunching of the bone and will actually be attracted not only by the smell, but by that sound. wondering why she's eating the face when it looked like there was more meat on the body. Doodles, I didn't see much meat left on the body. There's just a little bit around the neck um, and on some of the legs. Now, she will be trying to get into that brain cavity, obviously very high in protein, so a very good meal if you're a female leopard. Some brains, and so it's not only zombies, but leopards and lions that like brains as well. Hi, Cameron, who's eight, eight years old. Cameron would like to know, do any of these animals ever choke when they eat bones? Well, they can do, Cameron, and quite often they'll then start coughing and they cough up big hairballs of bones and fur, very smelly things, but they don't normally going to die from it. They're normally able to get it out by forcing it out. would like to know, by eating all those small bones, does that give her extra calcium? Uh, it does, Peggy, and you'll find a lot of the predators will eat um, the smaller bones, the bones that they are able to break up. Now, not all of the bone will be digested. Quite a lot of it will pass out in her feces, or she will vomit it out in a hairball as well. But generally, all the little bits that are broken up will provide extra calcium for her. So guys, we're gonna give, we're gonna wait for the other vehicles to come. We'll give them a chance, but we'll come back here later once there's not so many people waiting to get in. Station standing by for Karula coming. Copy, I'll make space for you. I'll come back a little bit later so everyone can get a chance to see her in the light. So, guys, we're going to jump across to Jamie. Uh, we're going to be try to come back to Krula if she doesn't move too much later. But we're going to give everyone else an opportunity to also view the spectacular animal. Oh, we'll wait until she repositions. There we go. So, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I'm so thrilled that we finally managed to get Karula on the screen. Brent's been tracking for two days solid trying to find her, so I'm very chuffed to managed. Unfortunately, I can't report the same progress from my side. I've tri triple checked Triple M, aha, uh -huh, but I really have triple checked Triple M to see if I can't figure out which way Mbula's tracks went once they went south a little bit. I've checked all the junctions. All 
is missed where the traps have gone off just because there is so much traffic going up and down that road what we'll do is we'll check along here and then add darker to where I had his last tracks and see if he does decide to do what Karula did in that block where I thought that he was going or where I thought she was and fingers crossed the same thing happens with a Vula and we get two leopards on screen for you this afternoon as an interesting side note just while I've been checking out the tracks for a Vula I count or I found the tracks of the one Birmingham boy that Brent had feeding on the buffalo carcass long after the other four had departed. He's moving back to towards Cheetah Plains and Coral Side to join the rest of his coalition. So even he's given up on the rotting buffalo. Unfortunately, I didn't stop with my calibers to measure his paw print. The reason I didn't do that is that they were quite degraded by the passage of vehicles. But if we spot some of the tracks moving along down here, we will most definitely stop and measure his paw prints and have a look and see exactly how large those paw prints are. I also want to see if I can't find Karuna's track somewhere on this road. I'm just to the south of that sighting. And since we know, we have a definite answer to which leopard made the tracks. And they've been crossing backwards and forwards here. In fact, that's a really good idea. Let's slow down a little bit. the measurements of Mbula's paw and Raisa had suggested that she thought and to be fair Raisa you, you did say you weren't entirely sure through the information that she thought were 11 centimeters at two years old but apparently had a look at the track or at the photos of the tracks and she's decided that or she's realized that it was nine centimeters instead no problem Raisa really not a disaster at all makes a little bit more sense I was picturing a leopard cub with giant sort of clown feet but that, that's perfect okay here's a lion track for us well spotted Viam. This is, it's a difficult one because it's on a main road. This is the back track of a male from what I can see. But it's a little bit faded. Nevertheless, let's just get an idea. So back track, we're comparing to Mvula's 10 odd centimeter back tracks. We'll just do a quick measurement since we're here and that's been our, our project for this afternoon. And so I haven't managed to track the leopard concern yet, yet. So backtrack of a male. It's actually easier to do in the sand. In sandy, coarse sand conditions, backtrack is, oh, that's a little bit exaggerated, 14.1. From top of toe to back of back pad. And in this case, it's his left foot. The reason I know that, this toe here is the largest, and it's exactly like our hands. So it's his right track, with the our middle finger is our largest. In this case, You're that's breaking the, up. Okay, thank you. Better not talk and bend down. So I'll do this this way. When you're looking at a, a cat track, the, our middle finger is the largest, the middle toe in a cat track is the largest. So the exact equivalent. Don't count the thumb because the thumb track is not visible in cat tracks. That's their dew claw. So there we go. So a difference, a size difference, that's the back track of 
or the rough backtrack of this male lion. This is the backtrack of a leopard, a male leopard. So a difference of about four odd centimeters between the two. This is quite fun. I'm enjoying myself tremendously here. Next, shadow, female leopard tracks. And you'll get to see the size difference. I have to find her tracks first though. That of course is the other deal. VM, your calipers were a brilliant idea. I'm having a great time. I hope you guys are all documenting for us. Think of all the fun we can have. Next time we find tracks, we can figure out the individual responsible. So Karula, from what I can hear on the Game Drive channel, is tucked away somewhere in here. So her tracks must be, must be on this road around here. We think, I think that due to the fact she's been moving up and down in this vicinity, there's a chance, north and south, there's a chance that her cubs are actually being denned to the prop on the property to the south of us, which is what we knew originally, but we thought that she might have moved them further towards Juma, so onto the northern side of this road. Now, in hindsight, I'm not 100% sure if that's the case, since she's been moving backwards and forwards from her kill. Oh, my goodness. Everybody hold your breath. There's going to be some dust here. While I let this vehicle come past on its way before the gate closes. And whilst I let the dust settle a little bit, Raisa was wondering, where's Karula? Where am I? And et cetera. And maybe also I'll add as an extension to that, where are Mvula's tracks? We're on Gauri Main, so the southern boundary of Juma. Her kill, from what I can understand, is between Weaver's Nest and Twin Dams, or was a tree house. It's somewhere in this, actually, sorry, I think it's somewhere in this block. It's between tree house, Weaver's Nest, and Gauri Main. So it's somewhere in directly to the left of me, right in the center of Juma. I'm sorry, I still haven't managed to get my map programmed, programmed onto my new phone. Mvula's tracks were last seen going south down Triple M, so our western boundary. And I can't tell you if they went off to the east or to the west, so whether they came back onto Juma towards the, or just south of the Balanites Junction, or if in fact he continued on west into Arethusa. My guess, and the reason that we're here now, is that I don't think he's going to want to go west. And the reason I don't think that is because there's always the potential of the Anderson male, and it's within Tingana's, it's that sort of gray area between Tingana and the Anderson male's territory. They're both bigger than him and they're both younger than him. I don't know that for certain though, because I never would have expected him to go into Simbabili either. And he did do that a couple of days ago. So Raisa, that is where we are, just to orientate you a little bit. Come on, Karuda tracks. Oof. I know why my eyes are burning, it's the dust. Now that the rain has gone, the winds have been blowing. It's been blowing up lots and lots of dust into the atmosphere. It'll be interesting, it will be very interesting to observe Mbula's behavior over the next few weeks see where he decides to head off to. He definitely seems to have got to the point where he pushed all the way. There's also quite an impressive
Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. So isn't this incredible uh, that Karula has made an appearance? I'm feeling a little bit silly. I literally stopped walking about 50 meters from where she was. Uh, there were lots of buffalo around, but I'm never going to stop 50 meters short of where I want to ever again. Just keep on tracking. But I thought the tracks were a little bit older. So very interesting. It means her, her, her den is definitely still not on Juma. It means she is keeping the cubs to the south of us. But the fact that she's hunting back here and those cubs are approaching two months, she's going to start moving them and even possibly moving them two kills. So very exciting times ahead. So what we're doing at the moment is we've stopped not too far from where Krul is and uh, we are waiting. We're just letting the other guys go through, cycle through the sighting. Uh, they generally don't seem to spend as much time as we do there. So we're going to do a little loop around the area and then hopefully in about 10 or 15 minutes, we will be able to go back to Queen Karula. I just need to have, unfortunately, you're gonna have to bear with a little bit of radio noise. I don't wanna miss our call in to go back there. So James Richard said that was an extra special, amazing sighting. There's something incredible about watching Karula feasting in a tree. She is the epitome of a leopard. She is a beautiful animal, James. And uh, I know all of us love her and love watching her. And it's gonna be splendid when she brings those cubs back. I'm really excited to spend some time with leopard cubs for a permanent, uh, sort of a prolonged bit of time again. Uh, it seems like ages since I spent time with little cubs, even though it wasn't that long ago. But it'll be great to actually share the cubs with all of you, wherever you might be, and bring a little bit of our home to your homes. So literally, we've had her tracks. Zip, 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 all in this area. Uh, this is where I went walking yesterday. Oh, one of those things. Next time, I'm sure luck will be on my side. And hopefully not too many buffaloes around the next time I have to go traipsing into the bush after Karula. Now, actually, what you guys couldn't see while we are in that sighting, there were probably four or five Duggar boys less than 50 meters from her. Brain, 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 brain. Standing by. I've lost track of all the standbys again. Who's after you on? I just want to give it over to them. I think it is Ephraim is last, uh, is first standby, and then I'm back to second standby. Okay, thank you. Ephraim, so are you making your way? Yeah, sorry, guys, that's, uh, I'm actually going to be a little bit busy on the radio, but it is worthwhile okay. having a bit of background noise till we get back to the Queen of Juma. So it seems like the plan of not really looking for anything is the way forward when it comes to tracking animals. 
No, I'm only joking. I can't really do that. I always tell myself I'm going to go out and I'm just going to drive around. I'm not going to have a plan. I'm not going to focus on anything. Uh, but that never really works for me. As soon as I hear the word leopard track, I'm on it. Or lion track or wild dog track. I feel the need. I have to see if we can find them. Yeah, let's go have a look what's at Twin Dams uh, before we send you back across to Jamie. Maybe there'll be a beastie there. We're nearly there. Definitely feel the evening's getting a little bit more chilly as we move in towards May. So I definitely think it's going to be slightly more pleasant in the evenings for the people who don't like the heat. My, I myself am petrified of the beginning of true winter. I really am not a big fan of the cold. You will see me bundled up in as many layers of clothing as possible in not too long. Any Duggar boys? Nope. But quite a beautiful setting. Now, while we are sitting here, Paula is wondering why are Cape Buffalo called Duggar boys? So, Duggar is another word for cement when you manually mix cement. Now, there's a couple of different theories about where the name Duggar boy comes in. Uh, the one I know is a uh, during the early days of the mines in South Africa, the gentlemen who used to mix the dugger um, were known as dugger boys, and they were particularly cantankerous. Uh, they used to like to drink a lot and fight a lot, and were quite famous for being incredibly tough, because you've got to be so incredibly strong to mix cement constantly all day by hand. So now these days we have those electric cement mixers, but those used to be done by hand, and those individuals used to be quite a tough bunch, and they were always caked in that mud. So I think the fact that a buffalo has got quite a tough reputation, and the fact they're always caked in mud and it looks like pieces of cement stuck to them, is where they got the name Duggar Boys. So not much here, so we're going to keep listening to our radio. And keep listening to the radio, look at that beautiful sky. Okay, copy that to the northern side of Chicago. Look at how beautiful those colors are. What a spectacular sunset safari thus far. You can hear some lovely birds around, but we're going to start slowly making our way back towards Karula. While we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. And while Brent manages that and heads back towards Karula, Vim and myself have come all the way back across to the east. I was going to stop and show you the glorious sunset at a beautiful spot on Leadwood, but unfortunately, somebody else got there first and is currently enjoying their drink stop and their sundowner stop. Thank you, Vim. Much appreciated. Very strange feeling not being in control of your own headlights. But it is the way of things for now. I'm going to do a quick perusal of the eastern boundary before heading back to where I had the last tracks of Mbula and just see if maybe, just maybe, he's going to pop out for us at the end of the sunset safari. One very skittish waterbuck, what his problem is unusually skittish. The water back on this particular part of the reserve are usually quite relaxed. Is he? He's actually gone completely. Oh, there he is. He's hiding right at the back. Hmm. On a mission. 
amazing how when there's been a waterbuck standing on a road, Sorry, just listening to the game drive comms. What was I gonna, oh, I was going to say how amazing it is when you drive past an area that a waterbuck has been in and how distinctly that smell of waterbuck hangs in the air. It's a damp, very musky scent to it. Now, when we get across to the clearing at Mumba Road where the buffer, or where Brent set up his time lapse yesterday afternoon. We'll go and we'll just have a look out across at the sunset. Not quite as spectacular as we've experienced over the last few days, but maybe we've just been spoiled. It's still beautiful enough in its own right. And this is definitely one of my favorite times of year in the bush, particularly in the evening. that Brent put up a time lapse over here just by the buffalo skull and Kai was wondering how that time lapse turned out. The answer is beautifully. It really, really was a pretty setting that he chose. I love the artistic framing with the buffalo skull. Now that sort of artistic eye is something that I almost lack or I totally lack. but Brent does not, and his time-lapse turned out beautifully. Here we go. He set it up behind. I can see where he's placed the buffalo skull. <laughs> and here's the view out over the evening bush. Not as dramatic as we have seen recently, but beautiful nevertheless. Right at the back, the silhouettes of the Drakensberg Mountains. And the, the longest mountain range in South Africa. 1,000 kilometers, five, over 500 miles. It seems as though we've got lots and lots of new viewers on board with us over the last day or so. Kerry has just started watching yesterday and has said that she absolutely loves it. I'm thrilled to hear it, and I really hope that you were enjoying that leopard sighting with Brent. There's not much more spectacular to look at than a leopard in the sunset lying in a tree with a kill, especially the Queen of Juma. Definitely doesn't really get better than that. I really, I'm glad you got to enjoy that. Just trying to think if I can risk going down Mumba Road. I think we'll give it a go. Fortunately, Wendy's been a little bit haphazard with signal recently. It seems as though there are certain areas I most definitely can go and certain areas I can't. The areas that I can go are very much separated by the areas I can't go. So it does restrict me a little bit in terms of movement. But let's see if Mumba Road works for us. Before we head back to wherever Vula decides to pop out. Almost, almost dark enough for the spotlight. There's that fraction of a, there's a that little in between time where it's a bit too dark to see with the naked eye. But at the same time, the spotlight is not quite dark enough for the spotlight. And all it ends up doing is illuminating the bushes on either side of you. But I think that we might be past that time. Now, it's a little bit too late for us to play this game today. 
but I've had a thought about what I have planned for tomorrow. That, of course, could go out of the window, sightings dependent. But I've decided to be very brave and to challenge Brent to a competition that spans throughout the drive where you have to, at every sighting that you stop for, you have to specifically pick a fact or a story, say that this is your interesting fact or story, the end, the viewers can judge which of us has come up with the most. Perfect timing. We are back. And there's now. We're just going to try to get around. So we can get a good view of Kula. She's still in the tree feeding. So unfortunately, we didn't have to wait till too long till we got back. Trying to get a gap through the bush there. Oops. It's a big log I'm just trying to jump across. There, there we go. Happy? There we go. So there she is. Still up in the tree. I don't think there's gonna be much of this diker carcass left. I think this might be her last night feeding upon it. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So Donna, who's in sunny California, would like to know, we often talk about how leopards and lions go for the most nutritious parts of the animals first, like the liver, lungs, heart, uh, but how do they know? Donna, I'm pretty sure it's instinctive. They, they probably know and can sense that there's nutrients there. Sorry, guys, just got to be on the game drive. I don't think there's anyone standing by at the moment. Sorry, guys, one more second. Sorry, I, will, uh, I think maybe Davina was first standby. So, oh look, she's moving. Look at that. So very little of the carcass left. Crunch, crunch. Sorry guys, last time on the radio for now. I feel like uh, there's three stations with a Karula, but you're more than welcome to take first standby. Best access is Weaver's Nest Junction with Treehouse Road. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, I'm going to make my way down there. I'll call again when I'm ready to take a standby. Copy. Look, she's moving again. Trying to find a spot to get comfortable and also make sure she doesn't drop that carcass. Oh, there we go, she nearly dropped it there.
Isn't this amazing? You guys are joining us from all around the world, and you're looking at a female leopard feasting, feasting upon a diker, alive from the African bush. If we do have any new viewers out there, and you would like to ask me any questions about what's going on in the tree next to us, please feel free to do so. You can drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv, or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So Glock on YouTube says this leopard could jump on someone. I, I know how I feel when people watch we, me eat. Uh, I don't know how she feels. Well, Glock, I don't think she sees the individual people in the vehicle. She sees the vehicle as a single entity. And a vehicle doesn't smell like something she'd want to eat. It smells of diesel or petrol, oil. And even people don't smell like they used to, it's what she instinct instinctively knows people to smell like. We smell of deodorant and sun cream and shampoo and clothes washer. So I don't think she's going to jump onto anyone just yet. question from Michelle who's just tuned in and she would like to know what Karula is eating. Is it a grey diker? Yes it is, a grey diker or a Grimm's bush diker. A, a male grey diker. Now we did mention a little bit earlier but Karula's two favourite food species are the grey diker and the Stienbork. Now she is a small female so a big adult impala would be quite difficult for her to hoist into a tree, so she tends to specialize on the dikers and stembocks. Not to say she won't grab an impala if the opportunity comes across, but she tends to hunt in areas uh, where they've got lovely, for her, lovely monkey orange thickets, and those areas have a lot of stembock and diker in them. It looks like a bit of the rib cage, or what's left of it. See, another reason why these small antelope are quite good for a small female leopard, she is able to crush up uh, the bones without too much difficulty, so very little of this carcass will go to waste. So guys, if you hear that click, 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 I'm just getting a few snaps of her in the tree with that kill. And I encourage you guys to take a screenshots, uh, pop them on our Facebook page uh, or on Twitter, which the hashtags for it live, or one of the numerous Juma junkies or other groups. And uh, we do love seeing you share all the pictures you're able to grab while out on safari with us. And she's making very short work of this diker. Jerry Mosser would like to know, have I ever seen a leopard pull a kill into a tree? It seems near impossible. Do they have any special adaptations uh, to help them do that? Jerry, they have an incredible 
upper body strength and they're able to lift probably not quite double but nearly double their own body weight and they're just incredibly strong and powerful animals there we go that looks like a rib Oop. whoops well no hyenas there to pick up on it just yet So it seems like California is all on safari this evening. And Amy, who's watching with her sister Ashley, this is Ashley's first time on the live safari, she said she's noticed that the animals, are, the leopards and lions, pant quite a bit and would like to know why. Well, it's because it's their way of dealing with heat and the digestive process creates quite a lot of heat. So they pant uh, to bring air over the blood vessels and, and veins in their in their mouth to cool down that blood and send it through to the rest of the body. It's their way of cooling down. So you can just hear that crunching of the rib cage. Now, the only bones she's not going to be able to eat on this carcass are going to probably be some of the larger vertebra uh, and, as I said, the skull cap. Now, the skull cap is this tiny little area where the horns are, and that's the thickest part of the bone. Cheers, F. Thanks, and for. Isn't this just spectacular? Being able to sit here as darkness sets in, watching a female leopard, wild female leopard, in her natural habitat. Very, very special. So, guys, I'm just gonna have to be on the radio for a little bit. So we're just going to go for a quick update to see what Jamie is up to. We have returned to where Buller's tracks were last seen and I'm going to check all around really carefully. Night has fallen and of course that is when leopards and other such things are at their most active. At the moment though we've just got a wildebeest. Sorry Vildi. you go into the darkness. Good luck. Lots of impala and general game around here. So he hasn't moved through here. Let's go back and check this block. Sandra, 
who's watching in Boston. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. I hope you've been enjoying your time with us. You're wondering on the subject of that wildebeest that we've just seen, whether wildebeest ever migrate, sorry, Paula, in the same way that they do with the great migration of Eastern Africa. And Sandra, no, they don't in South Africa. There's a couple of reasons for that, although they will move not, not in the huge herds that we see, but they will move from place to place depending on the grazing opportunities and where there's been the most rain. For example, our wildebeest herd that we watched for ages, weeks on Juma, has moved off and I think has gone north towards Biffles Hook. But that's not a great migration at all. They don't migrate in the same way that, they, that the wildebeest need to do in eastern Africa according to the rainfall patterns and the grass growth patterns. Oh, okay, let's go to Karuna. Sorry guys, I'm still just on the radio, but while I'm doing logistics, let's, we're going to try to keep this great view. Stanley Wabak. I'd like to take that standby and uh, quarantine. Mark, um, I think if tax isn't coming here, you can be third vehicle. Thanks very much. She is really, really tucking into what's left of that diker. So I think she might even leave some little scraps before the end of tonight's safari and maybe head back towards where her den is. interesting once her cubs get a little bit bigger uh, just from a, a genetics point of view because we're going to collect some of their feces and they will do a genetic test to see who the father is because she's mated with Tengana, Mvula, the Anderson male as well as the unknown or skittish male from the north. And those are the only ones we know about her mating with. She could have easily mated with another one or two, maybe one from the Manuleti, one from Malamala. So it'll be very interesting to see if they, uh, if who the cubs belong to, so to speak. Up until now, it's always been very much a guessing game because female leopards do mate with so, so many males uh, when they are in estrus. And of course, this is a really, really smart evolutionary tactic to ensure that all males that might come across those cubs assume that they are theirs. So if a male leopard that hasn't mated with her comes across the cubs, it will kill them. And that will immediately send her into estrus, so she'll start mating again. So very, very interesting, uh, the different strategies that these animals have to ensure their genetic line is passed on. Okay, guys, the other vehicle's moving. So we're going to move in a bit closer. Times. We're now going to be in the best spot. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to see which light genre prefers. Um, do you want that one, Jandre, or that one? A, bit of spot. A, mix. a mixture. 
like that. There we go, perfect lighting. So, Mason is a new viewer. This is only his second safari. Nathan, sorry, Nathan. And this is only his second safari. Well, Nathan, generally we don't. It is nature, so we generally try to let nature take its course. The only time we will intervene if an animal is injured by, directly injured by a human, uh, by a car or by a snake. And the other thing is only with endangered species, so wild dog and cheetah. But again, generally then only if there's been human intervention. Often we just let nature take its course. A lot of people think that's quite harsh, but this is nature. And uh, who are we to interfere? And a very lovely way to describe this, Nathan, is, oh, is she going to drop it? Don't, it's hanging on by a sinew. Don't drop it. <laughs> oh. I think she might try to pull the whole carcass higher if she can't get to that. Oh, oh. That's a nice big bit. Don't fall down. Sorry, Nathan, back to your question, um, is that we, are, we live in Eden, and for some reason human beings try to become gardeners in Eden. So we take a perfect system and we try to change it to suit our needs, not its needs. So that's why a hands-off approach when in wildlife is often much better. There we go, she's gonna try to pull the whole carcass up. There we go, she's got back to the juicy bits. Oh, listen to that, she's crunching that upper, upper thigh, breaking open the bone to get to the marrow. Debbie is curious, does Karula need to eat more than usual to feed her cubs? Dr. Debbie, I'll be with you in a second. I just need to... My uh, best visual is almost directly behind my vehicle. So there should be tracks going in front of me and coming around behind me, it'll be the best visual. So, Dr. Debbie, she, she probably does need to kill a little bit more regularly than she would if she didn't have cubs. Uh, of course, she has to produce milk, and that can obviously needs a lot more meat. But I wouldn't say that much more than usual. She probably, instead of having to eat once every three or four days, she's probably now hunting a little bit more regularly, probably once every two days. And uh, we all know what a successful hunter she is. So I don't think she's changed too much. got into that top part of that bone now. Look at that. She's getting a bit of the muscles, but she will definitely crack open. She's already cracked open the top part of that bone to get into the marrow. And we'll use her, see, see her use her molars and premolars quite extensively as she gets towards the so-called dregs of this carcass. So there's not much sort of muscle meat left but I know a lot of our regular viewers have seen 
Karula doesn't like to waste, and she will literally eat this little dica down to its hooves, and in some cases, will even swallow its hooves. We've seen her do that a few times, and even though she can't digest the hooves, they'll just be passed out in her feces. Astralina says she's mesmerized every time those claws pop out when she needs to grip on and hold the leg. And there we can see very nicely how a leopard's claws are retractable. So only coming out when she needs them. There we go, you can just see them now. A little bit in the dark. Oh, there we go, listen to that. See how she turns her head to the side, using her molars and premolars to crush that bone. As I was saying, I don't think there's going to be much left. I think she's probably going to head off back to wherever she's stashed the cubs this evening. Making short work of that leg. We're just going to keep nice and quiet for about 30 seconds so you can just listen to that crunching sound. So the main reason she's crushing, crunching through that bone is to get to the very protein-rich bone marrow in the center of that bone. Oh, look at that. Christine says Karula eating this dica reminds her of a Texas barbecue. Uh, splendid, splendid, messy, delicious feast. Well, Christine, sounds like I need to go to a Texas barbecue the next time I'm in the United States.
I do like my meat rare, but not quite as rare as Karula. Licking her chops. Joyce in New Hampshire would like to know why are Karula's teeth so yellow? Surely they should be much more white with all the bones she eats. And she, Joyce also thinks that lion's teeth are whiter than Karula's. Joyce, probably not. And uh, eating the calcium is not, not necessarily going to make the teeth, teeth white. And they are pretty in, in very good condition for, for a female of her age. And you can see she doesn't have any broken canines. Oh, looks like she's heard something. Nope. Back to munching, just making sure there's no hyenas around. There we go. She's going to move once left of the carcass. Oh, maybe she's looking at that piece she dropped just now. Looks like she's going to come down the tree right in front of us. Uh, she did drop quite a substantial piece a little bit earlier. And she's a couple of pieces. She's quite lucky there's no hyenas around. Look at that. She's right next to us. She's going to move off now. She might head towards Treehouse for a drink, but I doubt it with the amount of water that's around at the moment. I think she's more than likely going to head back to wherever she is keeping, keeping the cubs. Wasn't that incredible? Let's go see if we can keep up with her for a little bit. direction and where she's heading, but I think she might lie down first and have a little preening session. Richard in the United Kingdom would like to know, do the lions and leopards have a set taste? Do they prefer certain animals to others in terms of feeding? Uh, yes and no, Richard. I mean, all these predators are opportunists, and they will leap upon anything that happens to present itself. But also, with her being quite a small leopard, she tends to focus more on the smaller uh, antelope species, such as Stenbock and Dyker. 
and young, young Inyala, female bushbuck, is sort of like the biggest she goes for regularly. We have seen her with baby kudu, so generally anything that's within their grasp. In this area, lions seem to show a particular preference for buffalo. And we do have a lot of buffalo around here. So they do tend to show some form of preference for them. Now, you see she's finished feeding. She's having a good clean. Leopards are very fastidious cleaners, even though they even though they clean themselves all the time, you wouldn't want to really want to touch them too much. They're full of all sorts of nasty creatures, mites and ticks and fleas and flukes and tapeworms and all sorts of other stuff. Here you can see the tip of her tail quite nicely there. Let's try and get on the other side so we can have a look at her face one last time before the end of the sunset safari. Keith in Lock, Long Island is wondering which of the cat species has the most successful hunt ratio. So amount of time, amount of hunts, amount of successes. Is it leopard or lion? Uh, well, actually, it's cheetah have a better success rate than both leopard and lion. Leopard and lion are on average for the Greater Kruger National Park between, between uh, 11 and 14 percent. And uh, let's go. How's that for you, Jandre? There we go. So, Peter, cheetah have a better success rate than both leopard and lion. So, of the big cats that we can possibly see within our area, uh, cheetah have the highest hunting success rate. Isn't this wonderful? Just sitting quietly in the dark. So I'm not going to ruin this moment by jabbering on. So let's just have a moment of silence with the leopard.
So a huge Safari Live welcome to David, who's a new viewer watching for the first time with his 18-month-old daughter, who is completely mesmerized by the cat on the screen. Now, David would like to know how old this particular leopard is. Uh, she is about 13, David. So getting, getting on a bit in leopard years. but still in magnificent condition. And she does have two young cubs at the moment who are in a den somewhere to the south of us. Oh, there we go the evening constitutional. We just got to make sure we don't drive over that. Otherwise, we will be have a very smelly car on the way home. Now, quite a long time ago, I accidentally drove over some male lion dung and then went up to a buffalo. And every buffalo I drove near ran away very quickly. Look at that. She's right next to the vehicle. She's going to move off back towards where the den is. I'm not going to follow any further. We've had such a fantastic sighting with her this evening. She's probably just going past Jandre there. Let's have a look. There she goes. Behind Jandre, heading directly south. So we're pretty sure her den site is to the south of Gauri Main. But as Karula shows you her bottom, we bid her adieu. And hopefully, she decides to move back tomorrow morning. So from myself and Jandre here on the Rust Bucket, have a wonderful rest of your Easter weekend. And don't forget to join us bright and shiny tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. And let's go. There she disappears. Very special way to end Saturday. I know a lot of you call Saturday cat -a day so there we go, a cat at the end of Saturday. Bon voyage, Karula, and she's off to her little ones. And we are going to be off to try and find ourselves so a meal just now. We're just sorry, the light's been off because I have been peppered with every insect that is in the low felt. There we go, here I am, out of the dark. But wasn't that fantastic? I can see Jandre has got a huge smile on his face. I've got a huge smile on my face. It is always wonderful to spend some time with the Queen of Juma. So, absolutely splendid. We're going to start trying to get our way out of this thicket and leave her be on her way off to feed her babies. So, fingers crossed, she moves those cubs back in the next little while. I thought I heard a hyena coming, but I think that hyena is quite far away. So, don't forget, pop your screenshots on using the hashtag Safari Live wherever you can on Twitter, Instagram, uh, what's the other thing? Facebook. So, Oh, quickly to Jamie with the serval. You're not going to believe this, but I think I've found the serval again. Or I've found two, a pair of stem books. That might also be the case. No, that ears look wrong. No, no that, that, that's a daker. That's also slightly embarrassing. <laughs> Is it a stem book or a daker? <laughs> Oh, well, I got a little bit overexcited there. It's in exactly the same place as I saw the serval, and it's just one very confused-looking steering book. Oh, well, such is life. It's been a quiet afternoon otherwise on my side, but nevertheless, it sounds like you had the most extraordinary time with the Queen of Juma. I'm just taking my headlights off the poor Dacre as quickly as possible. Oh, we've come now to the end of another spectacular evening out in the African bush. The weather's nice and temperate and everything's looking extraordinarily beautiful and clear. It was worth a good try. Nevertheless, we're going to say goodbye for you, bye to all of you. Thank you, Viam. 
and thank you to Lou and Jerry. Good news is, once we are done, the Juma Dam camera seems to be the right way up this time around. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Cheers.